Welcome to Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry are four longtime friends with more than 70 published books between them. Together, they host Friends and Fiction with author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing to highlight and support independent bookstores. They discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Friends in Fiction show. I'm Mary Kay Andrews. I'm Kristen Harmel. And this is Friends in Fiction for New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories to support indie bookstores, authors, and librarians. On this week's show, Kristen and I are thrilled to welcome bestselling author Lisa Scottolini, an old pal of mine, to discuss her new novel, The Truth About the Devlins. The book was just released last week, and we're so excited to speak with Lisa. Yeah, we both read it. We both loved it. We've been talking about how excited we are to dive in. So it's going to be so much fun to have her on in just a minute. But first, we have just a quick reminder to check out all the fun things going on in our Friends and Fiction community at friendsandfiction.com. There you will find our show schedule, details on upcoming in-person events, and links to, ready for this, it's a long list, our bookshop.org page, the Friends and Fiction official book club with Brenda and Lisa, our merch store, our book subscription box, and our weekly email newsletter sign up. In other words, if you want to know more about anything Friends and Fiction offers, and we offer a lot, be sure to check out friendsandfiction.com. Now let's welcome Lisa Scottolini. Lisa is a number one New York Times bestseller and an Edgar Award winning author of more than 30 novels, including Loyalty, What Happened to the Bennetts, and Eternal. Lisa's over 30 million, 30 million. Did you hear that? 30 million copies of her books in print, and she's published in more than 35 countries. She served as president of Mystery Writers of America, and her reviews of fiction and nonfiction have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Philadelphia Inquirer. She also writes a weekly column with her daughter, Francesca Saratella, entitled Chickwit, which is now available online, and it offers a witty take on life from a woman's perspective. The columns have also been collected in a best-selling series of, excuse me, a best-selling series of humorous memoirs. She graduated cum laude in three years, three years, from the University of Pennsylvania with a BA in English and cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania's law school, where she later taught a class on justice and fiction. Lisa lives in the Philly area with an array of disobedient pets and wouldn't have it any other way. Her new novel, the Truth About the Devlins was just released this week. Alan, can you bring Lisa on? Hello, everybody. Hello, you guys. Aw, I love seeing you. Mary Kay, my old friend. Chris and my new friend. Yay! Girlfriends Unite. Yay! Absolutely. We're so happy Yay. to have right. you here. Yay, great. Yay is great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lisa, let's get started. You already know what we're going to ask you first. No, I don't. <laughs> you don't? <laughs> no. I'm no idea. I was going to ask you what your hair color is currently. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It's completely fictional. (laughs) And and sadly, it's, I don't have my, my tour roots done yet. So I got to get on that. I I tried for the flattering kitchen lighting. So, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's basically a, what would you say? In reality, it's probably mouse brown, but it's, it's menopausal it blonde right now. It's <laughs> menopausal you know, blonde. I, I could say it's the title of one of your favorite backlist books of mine, Dirty Blonde. <laughs> I know. That's where I got that. Actually, I'm postmenopausal, which I'm half dead. So there you go. <laughs> well, Lisa, me. Lisa actually wrote a great book called Dirty Blonde. All right, Lisa. I had you- sex scenes. That was the last time I had sex scenes. I can't remember what sex is like, so I can't make a sex scene anymore. <laughs> I see my best friend for dinner. I go, can you tell me what happens? She's like, this, you do this. I'm like, let me take notes. This is serious. I've taken notes with the yellow legal pad. So lately there's no, lately being there's, uh, lately being 15 years, there's no sex scenes since Dirty Blonde. (laughs) Already my family for a reason. Sorry. (laughs) I'm actually going to ask you, Lise, is what is the truth about the devil's about? And then what's it really about? 
<laughs> what the Devlins is about is about a family. Cause I love writing about families. And although I write the historicals that, um, by the way, we should mention that you guys are my favorite authors. This is my only my signed collection of you all. You are so sweet. It's precarious. It's because I couldn't be in the other room because the Wi-Fi didn't work. But in any event, um, it's sort of interesting to narrow your scope after the historicals and kind of get back to thrillerdom. Uh, and it's a domestic thriller. The headline is the Devlin's is a family of lawyers, but there's one ne'er do well one wayward son who's recovering and an alcoholic. So he's in recovery. And he basically, in the black sheep of the family, there is a golden boy in the family. And in the first chapter, the golden boy says to him, I killed somebody. I need you to help me bury the body. And so you know right away that roles are going to flip and the family is going to be in a revolution. The tagline, which I wrote, is, are they a family or a conspiracy? And I'm like, Damn, that's a good tagline. <laughs> that is a great tagline. <laughs> it's thing, right? So that's what it's about. And, and what it's really about, I'll tell you what it's really about, which is, an, oh, you're so nice, Mary Kay. You don't have to do that. What it's really about, though, is how I feel emotionally. What else is new? Which is that I feel to a certain extent we're all flawed. And a little bit I feel like we're in recovery. I feel like we're a country in recovery, honestly, from all of the tumult, namely covid Okay, leave aside the politics. I, I, my brother has long COVID. I lost people in COVID. I feel like we are recovering. And so a little bit, you want to explore how hard can it get and how much can you come back from? And I know both of you have your different experiences with that um, and how hard it can get. And I think that's what life is about because you're not going to get, you're going to get hardship. It cannot be avoided, but you have to figure out a way through it. And you know that better than I do. And so that's really what I wanted to really write about. Can he find himself and he's going to lose everything in the process and what result? That's awesome. Look how serious I got all the, but you it's true. Deep. I love it. <laughs> she, she invited it. I'm like, she's so right. Oh, this is either talking about Bradley Cooper or therapy. And we're going to do probably a little of both. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about TJ. So the, the main character who you were just talking about. Right. You know, the thread of his recovery runs throughout this book. And it makes, it feels like a very grounded journey. That to me, I mean, it just, it made my heart ache for him as he tries to stay sober. I mean, you're very much with him on this journey that's obviously very difficult for him. So can you talk a little bit about the decision to include this journey to sobriety storyline? Right. And, and how a, did you go about getting it right? It's so fascinating because, to, at least to me, because the way I got it right was I went to AA meetings. I, I don't have a drinking problem. I have a carbohydrate problem. Like, okay, <laughs> Like there's pasta or bread around, I'm, I'm there. So, but you can go to AA meetings, certain meetings that are open to the public on Zoom. So I went to them and I'm actually a therapy fan. I had 10 years of therapy. That's why I'm oh, perfect. And so, <laughs> uh, so I, every time I was so moved by the struggle of everyone. And also I realized that these principles of uh, getting yourself out of a jam. Yeah. That is self-inflicted, by the way. I mean, it isn't confined to alcohol or drugs. I'm divorced twice. I've made mistakes. And nobody, they're unforced errors, man. Thing one and thing two, I i went right in. Oh, you want to get married? Let's do it. I'm blind, you know. So, I, and after that, you have to pick yourself up. So the world will give you hardship. But you may give yourself hardship. And that's what I wanted to look at. Because it can be a little unsympathetic. If you're judgy, yeah. but uh, having li right, right, Chris. I mean, for my point, I've lived a while now and I don't judge anybody because I've made mistakes. And so I have a great respect for the fact that you're going to screw up. And so he screws up. And partly it's very nice of you to say your heart is with him. I think your heart is with him because when I saw those people in those meetings, they readily accept responsibility. If you're an AA or yeah. uh, were there for drugs or alcohol, you're going, I need help, man. 
I just frigging need help. And I admire that yes. because it's really important that we present that to the world. It's, you know, more and more mental health issues are coming to the fore. And that's good for all of us because people yes. won't feel alone when they have them. And God forbid, you know, take their own life or something like that. I want to, so I thought, and is it, as a novelist, as you guys know, you want to make a character that's flawed enough to be realistic, but not so flawed that you go, come on, buddy, get it together. Yeah. And, and, and so he, I hope he, he chose that line. I like him as a character. I actually have a crush on him as a character because I think, I think that kind of self-inflicted wound as well as extrinsic hardship makes you softer, makes you more understanding, more empathetic. Right. You've lived that people, not everybody's path is an easy one, no matter what it looks like. And the thing about the Devlins is they have all the toys, Range yeah. Rovers, fancy car, curb appeal, money. They're rich. They're That's rich. Crazy. But how and also a little bit that idea of your family, of the roles that we have in our family. For example, in my family, we're really super tight knit. And um, I had a younger brother. And I'm just telling you, the rap on us growing up, you get that role. The role was I was a smart one and he was the cute one. <laughs> okay. You know, you know honestly, what, Ma Lisa, you're the cute one too. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. <laughs> right. Like, I, man, I'm single for a reason. I'm not the cute one. You were but, the cute one. Believe me. <laughs> smart one is not a great selling point for women, unfortunately. <laughs> but, the, but your point is very nice, which is that you, at some point you think, wait, my brother is really smart. Yeah. And I'm not a crone. <laughs> Not yet. Give me a couple of years. <laughs> so the point is, that's a little bit what TJ struggles with. That when you, and, and those of us, we're all mothers, you know, that we, you know, those formative years are so important. And if you're saying to a child, you are noisy, badly behaved, yeah. whatever, you, your kid adopts that. Yeah. And he has adopted, nothing is expected from me. Yep. I'll probably fail so I don't try. I'm good looking, but not much else. And at some point, so it becomes, in a way, coming of age at 30-something, which is something I love because I feel like I'm coming of age by my age. Well, but I yeah. feel like that's something we should all feel like all the time, that we're all coming of age every every moment of our lives because we're becoming better and better. And, and, you know, one of the things I really liked and appreciated about TJ and the Devlin family is that on the surface, if you looked at the family without understanding anything about the journey, he'd be the one who was the screw up, right? Like he'd be the one that you'd be like, oh my gosh, the whole family has it together, but not TJ. And in fact, right. it's, the op it's the opposite because TJ's done the work, right? That's exactly right. That's yeah. so true. And he feels yeah. so acutely, you know, all that shame, like you walk into the office, like my office, if I get a good review, it's framed. If I get a bad review, <laughs> I memorize it, but it's not framed. <laughs> So if you walk yeah, it's like into the here, right? <laughs> I hate it. But anyway, um, so you uh, you walk into their office and all of their good press and puff pieces are framed, and he's like, "You can't frame a mugshot," because yeah. also the other thing I want to talk about is a family business. You know that in bringing shame on himself and the name Devlin, the law firm name is Devlin and Devlin. He really hurt his family and their income stream. They're in recovery from him. And also, because when I was in those AA meetings, you could see very acutely the shame and the guilt and the awareness of the people in that meeting of the people they've heard. The program is so great in that it says, listen, once you go through the steps, one of the steps is making amends to people. And even that's lovely. I've known alcoholics who have made amends to me. And I, I didn't feel they have to, I understood, but I understood that as an exercise. So all of these principles are so life-giving and supporting, no matter what your path, your life has taken you on, that it was really, honestly, I felt so cleansed after I read this book. After I wrote it and after I read it too, I was like, all right, okay. <laughs> Which is the feeling I think you want to feel uplifted after you read something. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Lisa, your novels frequently have a subplot involving not just justice, but social justice. I remember Corrupted, which was about the failures of the juvenile justice system and exposed with the plot involving employee health insurance. And now with the Devlins, you give us a storyline involving medical experiments on prison inmates based on a horrifying true story of the medical experiments of Dr. Albert Klingman that he performed on prison inmates in Philly from the 50s through the early 70s. What I'm wondering is, do you go looking for these stories or do they tend to find you? That's so, thank you for saying that because I think it's really important and it grounds the novel 
And I think what happened, the, the headline is exactly as you said, since you're a journalist, you know how to tell the lead. <laughs> but the idea is that, um, a journalist too, I should say. The idea is that I was aware of the story because I'm a Penn grad and I live in Philly. And it's always been a source of, frankly, shame to me that, that there was an aspect of this doctor named Dr. Albert Kligman, who during the 70s performed medical experimentation on Philadelphia inmates in the seven prisons in the Philadelphia system that was unbeknownst to them. They were, they didn't really have informed consent. They were amazingly testing ointments and putting people under sun lamps and seeing all the thing. And it turns out that the ointment that they were testing was a for a pre, a for a precursor or a forerunner to retin-A. Well, I have used Retin-A in my life. And you go, wow. So these prisoners who were overwhelmingly black or minority were used, used to create a product that rich ladies put on their skin. Yeah. And, and the reparations were never made. Lawsuits were failed because of technical means like statute of limitations. Why? Because not everybody has access or can afford a lawyer. And it always kind of bothered me. And I thought, does anybody could do anything about this? And lately, Penn has apologized, as has the prison system, as has the city, as has a lot of people. But I'm like, open your wallets. An yeah. apology, you don't get to apologize. It's our Tuskegee experiment. It's our Henrietta Lacks. Yeah. So I was a little bit like... Let's make that a little bit of a subplot. Have a, have a lawyer in the firm who's trying to set that right because I believe in public interest law. I love when lawyers fight for justice. They do every day for little or no money or attention. And those, and those victims, even though many are gone now, some from illness is caused by that exposure. Yeah. How is that for injustice? Yeah. Uh, now, Lisa, the story should be told. Yeah. You know, that leads me into saying, um, you know, I love that you have such a healthy sense of outrage. I think we lose, mm -hmm. we've lost some of that. So talk to us about your view of justice. You're a former lawyer turned mystery thriller writer. Are you looking for conclusions in your fiction that we don't get in real life? Hmm. Question. I don't, I don't know. I think a little bit, you're not supposed to say I don't know, but I don't know. I think a little that what I find is you look at life with a perspective, right? And I, I ha and I'm like a lot of people, we all have a sense of what's right and wrong. Mm -hmm. That is not, has nothing to do with a law degree. Um, my mother always used to say what's right is right. It's just, mm -hmm. now it was her view. Although later the Supreme Court would say, I know it when I see it. And they were talking about pornography. No, you don't. <laughs> but in any event, um, there, I love that because the sense of right and wrong is something everybody has. And it's some outer limit, or maybe not outer, your point is so well taken, you get outraged because it's wrong. And somebody needs to say it. So a book like To Kill a Mockingbird, for example, is talking about that at gut level. This is wrong. Justice should be for all. We believe in equal justice in this country. So uh, justice is dispensed according to, uh, according to race in that book. Unfortunately, that hasn't even changed. We're making progress, but my God, we have to look at these things and always be mindful of them. And so I think when you look at the world, the bigger picture, and I love that about readers. You know, I think readers have empathy. And part of that empathy is being aware that the world doesn't revolve around you. And not, a, not everybody has it as good as you do. And hardship, as we're talking about, teaches you that... Everybody is struggling with something. And all of those things, to me, are of a piece. And that's why books matter. Because we can write about a struggle, or you can throw light, as you point out, Mary Kay, on this awful thing that happened in Philly yeah. that not even Philly people know about, and yeah. go, look at that. And then people will say, that's just like X, Y, and Z. And that's not a good thing. And they get outraged too. And what's so wonderful about this country, among the many things that are wonderful, is that we can affect change. We can vote. And we should. And yeah. we must. And we can change law. We can petition legislators. We can, a lot can happen once we assume the power that the framers gave us. Yes. Vote for me! I got so okay. <laughs> Lisa for president. I, you've got my vote. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, you know, Lisa, um, you do so many things well, and I, including running for president, obviously. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I am astonished by how effortlessly you seem to switch writing gears. So, having read uh -huh. both your historical fiction 
and your thrillers and mysteries, I can say without a doubt that they are two just completely different types of writing, but you handle both of them so masterfully. You're like two completely different writers, like packed into one cute and smart, um, <laughs> one Lisa. So, <laughs> like so I... Me. No, it, it's well, true. No, I, I, I think want you to give you some great. love, and I want your audience to know because you are both so modest in every way. And Kathy, Mary Kay has been so supportive of me in the mystery and thriller arena. Sat down with me early on and gave me great advice. And you, you know, when I did switch gears to write historicals, you were among the first authors, Kristen, who said, "Come on in. The water's fine." You were so welcoming, and it's very scary to make that change because you also think, like, "Am I committing career suicide? Like, yeah. this is career suicide time. This is not a good thing. You're going to lose your readership." And also, frankly. I really admire historical fiction and I didn't know if I could do it. And you were so encouraging to me with Eternal. What you, I just never forget your reaction to that book and you wrote me and you were like, I'm reading this and I'm loving this. And it, it meant so much to me. And so your, your viewers must know for a minute that you both and all four of you when you're together are so supportive to other authors, not only in this show, but behind the scenes. And sisterhood really is powerful. And there are precious few platforms for us. And that you even give that kind of support behind the scenes to me, as you both have done, when nobody would know, when there's no Zoom and no camera and no applause. I just want your people to know that because the good you put into this world, it comes back to you. And I hope they, they feel, uh, I hope you feel my love and I hope you, I hope your readership and your viewership knows how much good you have put into this world. That is such a tremendously kind thing to say, but I, I I have to say though, I mean, I, I, eternal is still a book that I recommend very frequently. I mean, it it is truly one of my favorite world war two novels. I I think you're, it, it was, it was stunningly well done in a way that that I don't know that I expected when I sat down with the book. Like, be, because because you do this other side of your career so well, but it was like a different person had come in and written these books, but with the same heart. It's just, they, but, but they are two different types of writing. And obviously the volume of research is a big difference between writing historical fiction and writing a contemporary thriller. But can you talk to us about some of the other differences in in writing those two books? I mean, is the process different? Do you outline the same way or not outline? Or is your process different for writing both types of books? Right. Well, you know, like I don't outline. Someone who's divorced twice is not the outlining kind of girl. (laughs) I've been writing with both feet going, this will work out. (laughs) But, you know, and what I really discovered, although I'd like to you know, I got to tell you, demystify it a little bit for myself, is that there really isn't, there's no difference in the process. There's more research for historical because it's period research, but I did a lot of research for Devlin's that is not, that is not so evident. Um, And it must be, okay. It must be evident for a thriller. But I want to go back to your point because I thought it was so important about the coming of age, because essentially I think a lot of novels, including your own, both of you, is that I think you're always, the character is certain to a certain extent is coming of age. I think with respect to my career writ large, as you said, I'm coming of age at 68. It's a little late, (laughs) but you know, (laughs) how, what, and I I hope that people out there who want to write or just want to live their lives understand that you can find a different gear no matter what age you are. And I was afraid. I mean, I was afraid. That's why I wanted to thank you personally, Kristen, for for being so encouraging to me because I held myself back. Women don't take risk well. In fact, Mary Kay, you and I have talked about that. We talked about that way a long time ago over Coke in in Atlanta in that little sandwich shop. We don't take risk well. We certainly don't promote ourselves well. And if you're not promoting yourself well to others, you're not promoting yourself well to yourself. So you have to think, Lisa... Just you can do it. You don't know how many years you have left. If you want to write historical, write historical. I'm writing on a psychological thriller now. I don't know if I can do it. We're going to find out later this afternoon because I got to get to work. I'm going to, well, I'm going to wipe off my eyebrows. I'm going to do them on for you. They don't really exist in reality. They're also fictional. I work on me. I'm going to take the film. Hello. Let me, let me show you my foundation. Look at this. This can you see how much foundation is? <laughs> Nothing wrong, but hey, I, I've got it on too. 
let's really demystify, man. Let's just take all the friggin' makeup. <laughs> Look at this. Here, here's my face on the thing. What? You know it was expensive oh, foundation yeah. because it's that thick. Anyway, <laughs> get the yeah. idea. I yeah. All right. So now we're gonna, all right, Lisa, we're going to get off the topic of uh, cosmetics. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we're going to talk about the challenges of writing a different point of view from your own. Sometimes right. we have all read books where male novelists blunder badly when writing female points of view, especially yeah. when they're writing sex scenes. Oh, I'm not going to go That's so true. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you don't have to elaborate. <laughs> okay, but this time, Lisa, you, <laughs> you are writing about a car-loving guy in TJ. Now, I know you've written books with multiple points of view in the past. How hard was it to capture TJ's voice with the truth about the Devlins? I know, and then you make a good point because I um, was nervous about writing men in the beginning. I wrote women for a long time because I felt like I'm, I wanted women main characters because I feel like we're never like the stars in our lives. Like we need to be stars. Right. And, but then at some point I was like, you know, Lisa, you, you don't want to feel like you can't do something. And so I was really close to my father and I'm really close to my brother. And I just was like, just channel, like you love men. I wish I had a man to love. I have barely two dogs. It's not the same thing. You know, it's like, okay, well, just try to go there. And what I, and it's like, you know, with anything, you're always fight, writing about someone who isn't exactly like you and you find the emotional truth in them. For me, it was that feeling of recovery that I feel like to a certain extent I'm recovering. And from self-inflicted wounds 20 years ago, I still lay awake at night and go, I can't believe I said that 40 yeah. years ago. Like, I can't believe I said that. I stood in front of a jury and said this, or I said this in a meeting and I didn't say that. Right. We all, I hope, I think we all do it. I hope we don't, but, but I'm speaking to their neurotics now. Listen to mommy, you know, that, <laughs> <laughs> that I was a little bit like, okay, write a man. And also a realistic man. It's very interesting because I think men have a, if you're writing any book, you to a certain extent, you're writing about what is a man. What is a man? He can't be, right? He can't be toxic masculinity. He can't be, I'm better than you at everything. And also he is in, he is in recovery. So he's trying to, he's trying to figure out who he is too. I liked his humor and I went with that. I like that he's a car guy. I happen to love cars. I, 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 I really, I love cars. That's awesome. and I'm addicted right now to Formula One drive to survive. I, and I don't drive fast. I just love the look of, and I've always loved cars. So I can play, I, I go into car auctions. You know, I learned about oh, the cars. Wow. I drove it. I know it's crazy, but that was the part. That's when you do, write about something you enjoy. Like if I write yeah. about a dog, right? You just like write about what you like. He has a cat, a cat, the cat that, okay. Uh, this is not a spoiler, but he has a cat. He gets a cat and the cat, and I needed him to be able to take care of the cat because his problem is he doesn't take care of himself. So yep. he can't take some care of something else. It turns out that the cat ends up having diabetes. And then you know what happened next? I finished the book. My cat got diabetes. And I was like, oh. what? I know. That's crazy. You have to eat that and that every day like TJ had to? Yeah. Well, know what? Now you have pills. Thank God. Oh, they didn't. okay. Wow. Okay. I know. I'm so happy. But let me tell you, I was like, Lisa, you manifested a diabetic cat. Could you not manifest oh a super high diabetic cat with a Maserati? Like, what is the oh. matter? With you? <laughs> you can't even manifest right. Like, get it together. <laughs> um, do you think in your next novel, you could write two lottery winners named Kristen and Mary Kay? <laughs> Would that be possible? We'll, we'll, we'll you cut you what? in Absolutely. if you could just manifest it. You know, I fantasize about winning the lottery and having all my friends to my house. So you guys will definitely be there. And then we will all divide the, the booty, the loot. Excellent. Excellent. That's, well, that's my dream. Oh, meanwhile, do I play the lottery? No, I just fantasize about winning it. Makes no <laughs> sense. Whatever. Just the missing step, right? You smell that. Oh, God. I <laughs> Um, so Lisa, nobody writes Philadelphia like you. Um, and actually side note, I do feel like if you win the lottery, you will have no choice, but to buy the Philadelphia Eagles. So it's going to have to be a very big lottery. Right. And then, you know, yeah. And, and then Bradley Cooper will have no choice, but to come into your life. I'll, I'll just, oh my I'll just God, leave it I'm that. so thirsty. My daughter says, mom, you're so thirsty with the Bradley Cooper. You have to stop. I said, honey, we're just joking around. <laughs> It's all fun and games till Bradley Cooper shows up at your door one day. <laughs> I'll take him as a son-in-law. I'm fine with that. 
<laughs> oh, there you go. Okay. It's all coming to you. That's a great line. <laughs> so, Lisa, can you talk to us a little bit about how you so perfectly capture the flavor and nuance of Philadelphia without hitting us over the head with it? Like, I, I kind of feel like, you know, it. no, like, I, I think that is a skill, though. When you write about a place where there are things you associate with the city, it would be easy to be like, and then he went and ate a cheesesteak. And like, do, do you know what I mean? But like, you, you give us a very solid sense of place without leaning on anything like that. Can you talk a little bit about how you oh, go about capturing nice Philadelphia? That's so nice of you to say, because I want to try, I want oh, to do. have that. Yeah. Line. I do. But, uh, but I think a little, the answer is editing because you throw okay. it all in it. Like, yeah, yeah you get out the cheesesteaks. <laughs> 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 like Emily Leonard says, you 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 leave out the parts that people skip. I'm like, I think I finally understand what he's talking about, yeah, right? Okay. Right? Okay, yeah. you get it. It only takes you 40 years of writing to get that. But I do think a little bit, these novels, the domestic thrillers tend to be suburban. And what I've kind of found is that I live in the Philly suburbs now. I lived in the city forever. But, you know, on tour, I've been to the Atlanta suburbs. Um, I've been to, to suburbs of Tampa and, and Miami and Oh, and uh, whatever the one in the middle is, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or, or, Orlando. <laughs> Orlando. No, there was a stop like Boca. Those Bocas are right, like nice. You want to get those gigs? Let's have a signing in Boca. Woo! Um, but that you start to understand that the suburbs have a similarity that you can play on because a little bit people go. Oh, that is like, yeah, you drive by the Wegmans. Oh, you drive by the Starbucks. Oh, there's a strip mall. More and more of life, at least for me, is in strip malls. My, all the doctor, the doctor, the dentist, they're on a strip mall. Well, what does that do to the character? Right? It doesn't, the place has less character, but the character becomes that. Which is kind of interesting because it's so universal. The big box store, the whatever. He says when he goes to work, you know, it's, when I went to work, I worked in the federal courthouse across from the Liberty Bell. Now that's a place you go to work. That's Philadelphia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. But here, the, his place isn't unique. Well, the, yes. the thing is, those of us who don't work from, either you work from home or you go out, they're not going to a unique place anymore. And you want to write to that so that people relate as well. So it's really, setting is a really interesting Yeah facet of books nowadays, whatever the genre, yeah. contemporary that is, because because of that homogeneity that we have yeah. and you don't want to make it faceless, you know, but that's great because you can even tweak it. Everybody knows what an office complex like. Everybody yeah. knows those stupid parking lots. Everybody knows what's like when you have to find building B and you're in building F. It's a nightmare. So I have all that stuff in this book for that reason. So it's definitely has a Philly tinge, but it's really suburban. Well, I, I thought it was a perfect balance. And we do have to ask you about the Eagles. Are you really a huge football fan or is it just like an Eagles specific thing? And, you know, Mary Kay and I ask, you know, may, we may or may not be asking because we both grew up in Tampa Bay. And, you know, I know your season came to an unfortunate end this year. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, aren't you nice? I take back I mean, all that nice stuff. <laughs> Lisa Scottolini never speaks to me again. <laughs> you, no, she's like, you're I'm a great. Bucks fan? Oh what? This transcends football. This transcends everything. I, are it, you, a, are you a big football fan, though, or is it just a big, I am. Totally okay, major. that's amazing. I, 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 I don't know. I'm like, I have, I, once, uh, there were, I read a study that said trial lawyers ha- Female trial lawyers have a fair amount of testosterone, and I actually think that's my problem. So that I like football. I'm like into Formula One now. I like. I'm into. That's I'm into Premier that. League soccer. Like I'm a oh, Totten, okay. Tottenham Spurs fan. I've lost my mind, is what I'm saying. But I never <laughs> because I have some estrogen left. I think it doesn't shade into like I hate the Buccaneers. It never is that because oh, is, same. And I, I have oh, no problem with the Eagles. I promise. <laughs> that's right. But we have no. We we, we women. Like we draw the line. We're not going to go to war. Correct. Yes. <laughs> I'm, not painting my face. I'm not painting my face in the team colors and my chest and wearing like a Vikings hat or no, right. No. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and I was a huge Hawk fans way back. Uh, all right, Lisa. Well, we've covered no, a lot of not today. today. That on camera, that went well. Oh. <laughs> 
We've got oh. a lot of green today. Um, I and you to over yours, Kristen. I'm sorry. No, stop. <laughs> Here we go. Here's the first order. <laughs> You can't, you can't bottle Lisa Scottolini. You no, just you can't oh bottle God, love. We love each other. Yeah. We love each other. We are. Yeah. I have such love for you guys. We Thank you for what yeah. you do. Thank you for what you do for all of us, for the world, for the good works. Mary Kay, my deepest sympathies on your late Thank daughter, lady, who, who did so much good works. And I know that you, she got that from you. Oh, and, um, Yes, yeah. yes, honey. Okay, now we're gonna yeah. we're gonna cut you off before you make me boohoo on air. All right, Sorry. Basically, if you'll stick around, we have one more question for you at the end. But first, we got a few quick reminders to our listeners and viewers out there. Okay, for all of you listening and watching, now that you've had the pleasure of meeting Lisa, the amazing, incomparable Lisa Scalini, we encourage you to rush out and buy your copies of. <laughs> the truth about the Devlins. It's the per and the perfect place to do that is in the Friends and Fiction Shop on bookshop.org. You'll be getting at a discount and helping to fund our show all while supporting our beloved indie booksellers nationwide. And we also want to remind you to follow us on Instagram and join our Facebook group, which is nearly a quarter million members strong. When you visit friendsandfiction.com, you can stay abreast of upcoming Friends and Fiction show guests in-person events, shop our merch store, order our book subscription box, and sign up for our weekly email newsletter, which is chock full of bonus content. If you love the Friends in Fiction show, we hope you'll leave a rating or review and remember to tell a friend. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you can catch all our back episodes and you'll never miss a thing. And when you subscribe to our podcast, you can take us with you wherever you go. And lucky you, because we're really very charming. Yes. <laughs> Okay, Lisa, one more question for you. How, you are so good. Well, how amazing. And I didn't know you did that for bookshop.org. That is a wonderful thing for independent bookstores. That's what we're talking about. You just proved my point. You guys oh. put it in the world. It's true. Right. Okay, Thank Lisa, you. where can readers connect with you on the road and online in the coming weeks when this book rolls out? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> look, I haven't, I'm, st I'm, it's on my website. I would encourage people to go there, scottalita.com. I am going on tour. My roots will be done. My foundation is staying at home. No foundation. Sorry. And my best bra will be on. Not like today. <laughs> Nothing shows. So fine. Um, so I'd love it for people to come because really God knows, you know, it's been a while since I've toured uh, with COVID and everything I didn't. So um, thank you for asking. I love to meet people in person. And I hope I get near you guys. I would, I would love to see you guys. Oh, my God. I, I love you, too. I oh, would God. absolutely love that. Well, Lisa, it was such a pleasure speaking with you today. I mean, no surprise. We love, we love having you on every time you've come on. You're such a fan favorite in our community. Um, oh. but we, we both adore you. And we just, we just want to say a huge thank you, not only for being with us in the Friends in Fiction show, but also for being such a fantastic member of this broader literary community. I mean, you were talking about what we do to lift people up, but you are the original lifter upper. I mean, you were, you, you were incredible. You have been so supportive to both of us, to so many people in our community. Uh, and it's no wonder people love you as much as they do. Oh, Chris, that right. is really, you got, we're going to start crying now. That's really, <laughs> okay, everybody. be sure to turn in next week for when Patty and Ron will be welcoming Joe Piazza to discuss her new novel, the Sicilian inheritance. That show is going to air on the Friends in Fiction Facebook page and YouTube channel on Wednesday, April 10th at 7 p.m. Eastern. And it will be posted to our podcast for your listening pleasure on Friday, April 12th. So thanks to all of you out there for being with us. We will see you next time. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. You can join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Also, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here.